Hi, welcome everyone um, to the um, monthly CIS webinar series, which is sponsored by the CIS, the USID Net, and LACID. Um, this is um, Monica Lawrence. I'm one of the um, ECI committee um, co-chairs. Um, I just wanted to welcome everyone. Thank you all for um, signing in. Um, we have two, hopefully, um, great cases for discussion tonight. Um, I am going to present the first one um, with the help of Dr. Joseph Church um, as the senior moderator. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with that one. Um, I think we still have people logging. And while those slides are loading up, just a reminder that if any of you do have any um, great cases, whether they're solved or unsolved, and you want to present them, um, please just send them into the CIS office. We are always looking for more cases. Okay, um, so there are the slides. So um, this one is um, an attempt to kind of um, bring some of the discussion away from um, some of the rare novel immune deficiencies and focus on something that a lot of us see in clinic um, and how people are approaching it. So um, this is a case called manospining lectin deficiency fact or fiction. So the patient is a 15-month-old um, African-American female with a history of um, recurrent infections. Um, essentially, since um, the neonatal period, she'd had, by the time I met her at 15 months, she'd had 10 week-long hospitalizations, um, mainly for respiratory, lower respiratory tract infections requiring IV antibiotics um, and all requiring um, repeated steroid bursts. Um, she did have strep pneumoculture twice from um, uh, BAL culture, um, but, but otherwise no organisms were identified, but um, most of the pneumonias were chest x-ray confirmed lobar pneumonias. She also had a history of recurrent otitis media um, and underwent um, PE2 placement. She um, had a history of being born um, by emergent C-section at 31 weeks for uh, preeclampsia. Um, she was in the NICU uh, for six weeks just for low birth weight, um, but was never intubated um, and really no complications. She did have a history of asthma that was um, treated with inhaled corticosteroids and singular, but was um, fairly poorly controlled despite all that. Um, there is a family history of um, asthma and pretty similar um, recurrent infections in the older sister, although certainly more mild without hospitalization. Um, Although it was not um, revealed to me until uh, much later after knowing her, after about um, a year, um, there was a, a history of consanguinity. Um, so um, you can see uh, um, our um, Probian and her sibling, um, and then uh, uh, her mother, and it was actually her um, maternal grandfather. Um, was um, her, their, the girl's father. Um, they lived uh, with mom and um, dad slash grandpa um, there and the two siblings, no smokers, no pets in the home. On examination, um, she was a healthy girl, no dysmorphic features. Um, she did um, pretty consistently have diffuse wheezing throughout her lung field. Um, and expiratory wheezing consistent with her history of asthma, but it was otherwise normal. Um, her initial laboratory workup, um, CBC diff was normal, chem panel was normal, and a chest x-ray done while she was well was um, normal. She did, as I mentioned, have prior abnormals when sick. So um, for the immune workup, um, these were drawn at 15 months of age. So her immunoglobulins were notable for a low normal IgA, um, but otherwise normal IgG, IgM, and IgE. Um, her um, titers to um, tetanus, diphtheria, and um, Hib were protective. Um, her C3 and C4 were normal. However, both her CH50 and her AH50 were undetectable. Um, those were checked on multiple occasions from multiple reference labs. Um, and upon um, further follow-up testing, her um, C8 function was found to be undetectable with normal um, 
C3, C5, 6, 7, and 9 function. Um, additionally, her Manos binding leptin level um, was uh, 29.1 at birth, and then when rechecked, um, or at birth, I'm sorry, at 15 months, when rechecked um, about um, a year later was slightly increased at 47, but still um, low. Um, to confirm the functional defect in the um, complement pathway, um, sequencing was done um, of the C8 gene. Um, she was homozygous for an intronic variant, um, and that variant is predicted to create a um, cryptic splice acceptor site um, and is um, predicted to therefore be um, damaging. Um, the variant had not previously been purported as pathogenic and, in fact, was present in 1.7% of alleles um, from African-American individuals in the 1000 Genome Database, so therefore it was characterized as a variant of uncertain um, significance. However, um, she did have that um, functional testing showing no C8 function. So for her clinical course um, for management, um, and then we'll open it up for a few questions by the end, um, just to, because um, uh, this is where I would love some input. Um, so um, she was started on rotating prophylactic antibiotics um, with monthly rotation of amoxicillin, Bactrim, and um, cefuroxim. Um, she was also given a prescription for Augmentin for mom to have on hand should she have a fever. Um, and she lives in a very rural area with limited access to medical care, so the advice was to take that for signs of um, a true fever and then proceed to get medical attention as soon as possible. Um, she was fully vaccinated with her childhood vaccines and was also given um, the meningococcal um, quadrivalent and group B vac vaccines as well as the Pneumovax. Unfortunately, despite this, um, she continued to be admitted to the hospital, um, you know, almost monthly. Um, we switched to a, a regimen of monthly IM antibiotics um, in addition to rotating oral antibiotics just to ensure compliance. And despite this, um, she continued to have ongoing infections um, with two more admissions for low bar pneumonia, um, requiring IV antibiotics and an episode of staph bacteremia. So um, about a year ago, um, out of um, truly desperation, she was started on IVIG with, um, you know, truly just as a last resort and had a dramatic clinical um, improvement to the point that she um, finally was able to go to school, started Head Start, um, and um, has had only one hospitalization and three episodes of bronchitis in the last 11 months as opposed to nearly monthly hospitalizations um, in the years prior. So um, the questions for discussion, which I think we'll have Dr. Church comment on first, and then hopefully the audience will chime in with their thoughts. Um, what's the culprit here? So um, is it the complement deficiency? Um, even though I will point out she has not had any history of meningitis and she has sinopulmonary infections, um, which are not typical for the terminal complement de defects. Is it the manual finding lectin deficiency, which is a much... Um, questioned true immune deficiency. Is it IgA deficiency? I have not rechecked um, her IgA level. Um, is it specific antibody deficiency, which again we have not evaluated for? Is it just poorly controlled asthma? Um, and um, what would be the appropriate treatment? Um, is IVIG reasonable? Does it make no sense? Um, what would you do? So with that, I will open it up to Dr. Church for comments and then to the audience. Well, this is, uh, uh, it's an interesting case because the uh, uh, mannose binding lectin patients I've seen have been adults uh, and uh, they didn't have low mannose binding lectin, they had undetectable. So I think that is um, uh, not, cons this case I don't think is consistent with mannose binding lectin. I don't think it's the CD8 and I don't think it's the IgA. 
Um, I think you may be dealing with a specific antibody deficiency because of the dramatic response to, to IVIG. I'd like to know how you got that paid for. Um, and um, uh, did, did, any, did you do a microarray? Um, we did not. We did targeted sequencing. So this patient has Medicaid, and I don't know how I got it paid for either. Um, okay. Honestly, <laughs> I'm uh, still surprised, but but they paid for it. Um, so no, she has not had a microwave at all. Um, okay. Obviously, and, she has. I'm saying yeah. The reason so. the reason I ask is that yeah, you might be able to identify those areas of uh, non heterozygosity that the real gene is hiding in. Hmm. Okay. So you think it's none of the above? Yep. Okay. Now, not that and, I um, don't believe in mannose binding lectin deficiency. I, I've had a couple of patients. I just have no other reason. Uh, and uh, they don't have diabetes. They're not in chemo. Uh, the Europeans seem to believe in it. And, uh, um, you know, uh, maybe it's because they're all cousins also. Um, but, <laughs> uh, sorry. Um a little New Jersey uh, humor there. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, so that's the, that's the, uh, 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 my feeling about this particular case. Okay. So, um, Pearl Yu from Rochester says um, it's because she's a preterm um, in, ex -pre preemie and that this is um, just because of that um, and wants to know, did I check pneumococcal titers? I did not check pneumococcal titers. She's only about, um, well, she might be close to three now. Um, but at this point, she's now also on um, IGRT. So I did not check them prior to starting that. And you can also, um, you know, you can still check the serotypes that were in the Prevnar that hopefully she received. That would be mm -hmm. at least something. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's hard to tell. The only other arena that I was thinking about is toll-like receptor. Because mm -hmm. uh, you had pneumococcus, and I don't know what else uh, might have been involved. But it's, you know, kind of the last thing I do is because I don't trust the labs that do most of them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And you got a, yeah, you got so a no, kiddo know. that's a consanguinity. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good point. I, I could check a TLR assay. Um, does anyone from the audience, um, anyone else have thoughts? Anyone want to blame um, anyone joining Carl for this is just because she's preterm? Anyone want to join me on the, um, it's the MBL? Anyone blaming the C8? I mean, there's an awful lot of kids at the that graduate from uh, uh, neonatal ICUs, um, and uh, we get asked to see them. But I, I just don't buy that this is related. Uh, the kid was never on a vent, um, mm -hmm. so we're not talking about primary, you know, um, vent damage. Uh, she's immature, but that should have been better. Um, you know, uh, the other, you know, I guess, uh, has she ever had a BAL? She has, and it grew strep pneumo. I can't Those remember the what pneumos. the differential Okay, because, um, you know, yeah. next time one is done, if one's done, uh, do a ciliary biopsy. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. That's a great idea. Okay. Uh, looks like Lisa Kubrinsky added a question. I can't figure out how to answer it. Okay. Okay. She says, agreed that all the MBL deficiencies we have seen have undetectable levels, which don't increase with age, but there may be a synergistic effect between the low complement and the low MBL. So, um, so that's um, one common thought is that the MBL and the C8 um, MBL is only significant in the setting of another deficiency. So, um, if that's the case, then how do we, um, you know, how do we explain the sister who doesn't have um, a complement deficiency and only has the low MBL? And now, granted, her infections are more mild, but they're still recurrent. Um, and 
And then while you're mulling all that, um, anybody, um, there was much, um, uh, the sentiment was negative towards treating complement deficiencies like this with IVIG on a recent listserv discussion, but does anyone have any thoughts in the audience about um, the use of IVIG here? Is this a total misuse? Is this reasonable because it's working and maybe we're treating specific antibody deficiency? Um, what do people think? I think the answer is in the uh, uh, results. Um, you know, and it's no, it's not a controlled, blinded study, but you know, going from monthly hospitalizations to almost none is fairly impressive. And this, in fact, is the way patients with real antibody deficiency respond. They, it's like somebody turned a switch and their major infections are markedly reduced. So, I, mm -hmm. I think that's very strong evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, it's hard for me to want to turn it off, um, oh. but at the same time, it's hard for me to um, hard for me to explain why I'm using it either. Right, absolutely. As long as uh, to me, as long as you understand that you don't prove anything uh, by doing it, if the kid's better at this point, I think you kind of just keep going. How old is the kid now? She's around three. Okay, because you're right getting close three. to um, uh, being able to immunize her with polysaccharide. I don't know if uh, many people have done uh, Jack Rudis's uh, Salmonella vaccine, uh, but that's been helpful in a number of my older patients. Yeah, and I do that routinely. I do that at um, I do that at um, H two. Um, so Carl is commenting that we might need to prove whether she has specific antibody deficiency because eventually the insurance may fight me on it, which is, a, I agree, a worry. Um, and I have been using s typhi response as a, a way to get insurance to pay, but I'm wondering, um, I have had some insurance companies push back. So I'm wondering um, if anyone in the audience has had um, insurance has reject the typhi response as an evidence of failure um, to respond. Um, to the, to a polysaccharide, or if insurances are being pretty willing to go along with it, or Dr. Church, what's been your experience? No, yeah, um, we have not had uh, arguments, and I think the big the big benefit or the big push uh, to accepting it was when Jack uh, uh, published his that paper, because mm -hmm. prior to that, you just had some abstracts, and uh, but that that you know, made it a lot easier, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, and what's wonderful is you can check it while she's on IVIG. So um, I think that's a great thought and it's approved down, I believe, to two. So I can definitely go ahead and um, and think about doing that next time I see her. Um, and so um, Lisa um, Kabrinsky commented again that um, she thinks that um, some insurers are going to, or most insurers are going to require me to stop it just to document the infection um, again. Um, and uh, we have an audience comment that um, we can't measure the anti pneumococcal antibody response during um, IVIG and can't stop the IVIG. So that's a, um, a reason to check the typhi response, maybe. Um, and then so, there's a question here Has she had an appropriate febrile and acute phase response? Fed rate CRP neutrophilia with the infections? And the answer to that is yes. So, um, Andrew, what were you um, worried about if she hadn't had a, an appropriate response? Were you, what are you thinking about? Andrew, are you typing or um, if you're still out there? I'm, I'm wondering if you're worried about a, a TLR defect or or what you're um, thinking about. Yep, TLR defect. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so so, so far the suggestions I've had are um, document better that she needs the IVIG either by stopping it or by doing the typhi response um, and then um, 
Dr. Church wants, and, and Andrew want us to check a um, TLR assay and maybe in a microarray. Any other thoughts from the audience before we move on to our second case? Again, I know this isn't the normal um, rare immune deficiency, but I do think clinically um, this is the type of scenario we're faced with quite a bit. So, um, the the, the problem the, with making a diagnosis and uh, for um, you know, indicating that that may be the reason for the infections, you can't do anything different anyway. Because you can't treat that. Yeah. So, you know, perhaps the uh, uh, the immunoglobulin is making up for the low MBL. But, you know, there's no additional, to my knowledge, it, uh, there's no recombinant MBL. Right, right, yeah. I agree. Okay. Well, um, I think um, unless there's any other questions that pop in, um, we'll. I guess we can go ahead and move to the second um, to the second case. Um, oh, here's one that popped up um, about keeping your own prophylactic antibiotics. Um, so she is um, no longer on the antibiotics um, while she is on um, the immunoglobulin. Um, she was uh, prior. Um, and that failed, and the vaccination approach failed, um, hence the starting the, the IVIG. Um, but no, she's not right now. Um, and one more thought about Iraq for a mighty 88. So again, worrying about the um, kind of the TLR type defects. So, um, you know, she she is febrile with illnesses. Um, she does have, you know, um, an appropriate response. To illness, but that doesn't mean um, obviously she did present in early infancy. I could certainly check it, um, and I think I will next time I see her. Monica, before we start the next case, I have one more question. This is Yasmin, mm -hmm. um, the other moderator, by the way. Um, I know you posted on the fellows listserv quite a while ago about where people are sending TLR assays. Mm hmm did you get any responses? I did not get a lot of responses. I got um, a response from um, someone at NIH who was specifically studying NEMO. Um, I tend to send them to the um, Arab lab. Um, I don't know if others have. We do as well. Um, other, other experiences. Um, the challenge is always that you need a normal ship, shipping control. And so um, it's hard because they don't like it to be a family member. Um, and so that usually well, means. fellows are four, isn't it? I was going to say that usually is what fellows are for. I'm not saying that. Um, so, yeah. Um, does anyone else in the audience have a, um, a, a lab that they like um, to send for TLR assays other than that? Um, if you do, you can um, put it in the chat box um, for everyone to see. And um, I will let uh, – it's um, AROP Labs, A-R-U-P um, Labs. Um, so if anyone has anything else um, for lab-wise, please go ahead and put it in the chat box. So I'm going to let um, Yasmin go ahead with the next case. So thank you all for your input. Hi, everybody. I am so pleased to um, introduce one of our amazing fellows. She's a first-year ID fellow um, named Kirti Dantrilluri. She is going to present one of our most interesting and challenging patients. Um, her faculty mem uh, mentor tonight is Gulbu Uzel from the NIH, who was so kind to think through this case with us. Kirti, take it away. All right. Thank you, Yasmin. So I'm going to present this case from um, my standpoint. I first met him when he was admitted for a concern of infection. So this was back in late July of last year. Um, he's a 10-year-old male, and he presented with one day of fever up to 100.8. He had increased work of breathing, left shoulder pain. He was fatigued and overall had decreased appetite. But those were all of his symptoms. He didn't have any cough, congestion, vomiting, or diarrhea. His past medical history... Um, 
is where it gets interesting. So he has a history of pulmonary atresia with BSD and aortic root dilation. He underwent repair with a BT shunt, uh, RV to PA conduit, and a VH VSD patch repair. Um, he also has a history of short stature, which I'll elaborate um, more in just a little bit. When he was eight years old, two years ago, he was diagnosed with microcytic anemia and he was started on iron supplementation. Around that same time, he was admitted for atypical pneumonia. And for the first time, he was noticed, um, he was noted to have thrombocytopenia and leukopenia in addition to the anemia. So this is where Dr. Khan and the other immunologists um, got involved and started a, an extensive immune workup. His bone marrow, um, we did a bone marrow aspirate, which was completely normal. And Dr. Khan, I was hoping you can help me a little bit with some of the cell set studies and, that we did. Yasmin. Yes, I couldn't oh, hear anything there for a while. Oh, oh, can you hear me now? I can, yes. Uh, okay, so um, I was hoping you can elaborate a little bit about um, a little bit of the initial immune workup um, with the lymphocyte subsets and... Absolutely. Um, this patient started out in our hematology clinic um, after <clears throat> an admission for an atypical pneumonia where he was found to be leukopenic. So he kind of worked through, they sort of worked through their protocol um, and started out with the bone marrow biopsy, got some, um, some anti-red cell and platelet antibodies. And someone sort of started thinking about ALPS at some point and and went on an immunodeficiency workup pathway. So you can see he had an elevated vitamin B12. Um, he had been noted to be leukopenic in the past and everyone um, thought that it may be related to him having heart surgery in the past. Um, it looks like Lisa Kobrinsky wrote in and said she can't see the slides. Is that still... Are other people having trouble seeing the slides? No. No, we're okay. Kelly, you can see them. Okay. Okay, we'll continue on. Um, it, we sent some um, more specific T cell phenotyping. And as you guys can see, he had lower numbers of naive CD4 and CD8 cells, consistent with maybe having had part of his thymus um, iatrogenically removed during cardiac surgery. And then he had um, some elevated um, CD21 positive mature B cells as compared to CD21 negative B cells. But otherwise, his B cell numbers overall were normal and NK numbers were normal and his B cell phenotyping looked okay. Um, further workup for his, for um, immunophenotyping showed that he had pretty normal immunoglobulin levels, good vaccine responses to diphtheria and tetanus, um, but did not have a great memory for Prevnar vaccine. He had a normal chromosomal microarray, array. we were wondering about DeGeorge syndrome. Um, he was on steroids, unfortunately, when we sent the mitogen and antigen stimulation the first time, um, and it was completely abnormal. We resent it, and he still had absent antigen stem, um, normal pokeweed, and low response to PHA and CONA um, about a month after he was off steroids but on Celsept at that time. Um, so at that point, he came to see us in our um, combined hematology, immunology, and infectious disease clinic. And we started thinking that he seemed um, more consistent with ALP. So we sent some genetic testing. The first genetic um, panel that we sent was to Cincinnati. Um, it was negative for, for common ALPs and ALPs-like mutations. 
And that included deletion and duplication analysis. And then we sent whole exome sequencing to AMBRE genetics, and that did not come back with any mutations. Um, his ALPS phenotyping was sent to Cincinnati. I'm sure that you guys are um, very familiar with looking at this information. Um, he met criteria for the three out of the four, um, or he had three out of the four criteria positive that they use for a diagnosis of ALPS, um, specifically double negative T cells, the B220 um, TCR um, double negative Ts and the HLA-DR ratio, but did not meet criteria with the CD27 um, B cell percentage. So his total score was three out of four. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, oh, sure. So um, he, after this workup, he was started on steroids, but unfortunately, one week into the course, he was admitted for a generalized seizure. He was found to be hypertensive and diagnosed with press. Your analysis during this admission also revealed um, red cells and casts, so he was diagnosed with hypocomplementemic glomerulonephritis, and that was through a renal biopsy. At this time, his uh, medication Medications included Salcept and Sirolimus, um, and he was on Bactrim prophylaxis because he's lymphopenic. He didn't have any drug allergies, um, and he's fully vaccinated. So, um, like I said, his kidney biopsy, he was diagnosed with crescentic um, immune complex glomerulonephritis. Salcept uh, was started, and he was eventually weaned off the steroids, and he's completely off as of mid-January. And what's interesting, um, one of the main concerning things to mom is he used to be in the 25th percentile for his weight. And about um, at age nine, he started dropping off the curve up to, um, and he was down to less than third percentile. His cell counts um, were also dropping. Um, the spike up in around January was when he, or before January, it was when he received steroids. And when he was weaned off, he was again lymphopenic. And by the time we saw him towards the end of July, he was um, very lymphopenic. And you can see a dip towards the very end of the graph. And similar trend with his ANC, um, he was neutropenic by the time that we saw him in uh, the end of July. He, 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 was, he was anemic for the past couple of years, and he was also thrombocytopenic with a significant dip right before we initially evaluated him. So um, his surgeries, he had a BT shunt repair in December of 2006. He underwent RV to PA conduit um, with closure of the VSD in May of 2007. He had a right inguinal hernia repair in 2007, um, a balloon dilation of his right pulmonary artery in March of 2011, and his renal biopsy was January of 2016. So when, by the time we evaluated him, he was on 500 milligrams BID of Cellcept and two milligrams of Sirolimus daily. Um, and this was started just two weeks before he was admitted in attempts to bridge off, the, bridge off from the Cellcept. So his family history um, was significant for infant deaths and recent uh, relatives, but um, the etiology of that was unclear. And his father apparently has a large heart, but um, we also don't have further details about that. He lives with his parents and brother. Um, he has two dogs, and he is homeschooled. So on his physical exam, um, by the time we saw, he, we saw him on the first day of admission, he was afebrile, tachycardic, and tachypnic. Um, he's noted to be uh, uh, very thin. He was less than third percentile for his weight, but he was non-toxic. He was talking to us in full sentences. Um, his exam was notable for uh, supraclavicular and subcostal retractions. He had decreased um, breath sounds at the bases, but no focal rails, no wheezing. Um, and again, he was tachycardic, and he had a harsh uh, murmur at his left upper sternal border. But this was our first time meeting him, so we didn't know if this was a change from 
previous heart exam. And he's also noted to have splenomegaly, which we didn't, um, which I believe wasn't noted before. And then skin findings, mom just brought up that he had hyperpigmented skin on his feet, but it wasn't very impressive to us, um, but just something that we noted. So his initial labs, he was pancytopenic. His white count was 0.9, hemoglobin 7.8, platelets 45. He had an ANC of 580, and his CRP was elevated. It was 65. There was a blood and urine culture. Um, blood culture was pending, and his urine culture was negative. So this was his chest x-ray. It was read as right lower lobe pneumonia, but clinically just didn't correlate. He didn't have focal signs of, um, of, of like a bacterial pneumonia. Um, and he had cardiomegaly, but this was uh, pretty much persistent if you compared pr um, to pri prior chest x-rays. So in summary, was, we have a 10-year-old male uh, with a history of probable ALPS and pancytopenia presenting with fever and tachypnea. So our thoughts when we saw him, um, just fever and tachypnea, we're thinking about pneumonia. Most commonly in children, we're thinking of viral causes, EBV, CMV, adeno, enterovirus. Um, and then bacterial causes, we're thinking of strep pneumo, mycoplasma, and group A strep. With his Shoulder pain, we thought about endocarditis as well, so there was a blood culture pending. Being neutropenic, um, we thought about tiflitis, although he didn't have symptoms um, to suggest that. Um, with cell lines being down, HLH is always on our differential. And, um, and then um, living in Tennessee, we thought about fungal infections such as histoplasmosis. So the first day with fever and neutropenia, we started him on cefepime. We gave, uh, we transfused him with red, red blood cells. Um, his serolimus trough was found to be 22. So we called Dr. Khan and um, she suggested holding on um, further dosing. He, he was still tachypnic by the next few days. He developed some diarrhea. His ANC was dropping. Um, and we added azithromycin to start coverage for atypical organisms. His RVP resulted as negative. His CRP was trending down, but he wasn't really improving. He still had these low-grade fevers, so we repeated blood cultures. Um, so thinking about endocarditis, we ordered an echo um, and ordered some more labs, uh, CMV, uh, EBV, mycoplasma, histo, and blasto. His blood cultures were resulting as negative, but the echo by the sixth day of hospitalization revealed vegetations in his pulmonary conduit and bilateral pulmonary arteries. So this kind of, um, we switched gears and we're trying to think about what could cause endocarditis. The most common causes are staph, um, enterococcus, and coagnegative staph. Um, and we thought about the HASEC organisms, but his blood cultures were negative, so um, we just didn't. We thought these would have shown up by now. So then we thought of culture negative endocarditis, specifically Bartonella, Coxiella, Brucella, and um, Histoplasma. So, of course, by this time, grandmother came in the picture, um, and we learned that she has many kittens. Our patient spends a lot of time with her, and they live in a rural area with exposure to farm animals. So we sent testing for Coxiella and Bartonella. Um, ophthalmology ruled out Roth spots, and a lot of the rest of our lab work was starting to come back as negative. The EBV, CMV, mycoplasma were all negative. His fever um, started to resolve, his histo and blasto studies were negative, and by the 10th day of hospitalization, his Bartonella titers were positive, um, as well as his Bartonella PCR. So we switched his antibiotic regimen to ceftriaxone, gentamicin, and doxycycline, and uh, eventually discharged him with um, long-term antibiotics. And, um, and he started doing well as soon as we started treating his endocarditis. He started gaining weight. I'm just going to skip real quickly to the next slide to show um, how quickly he climbed back up on the growth curve. Um, sorry. 
and he completed, um, we saw him back in clinic a few months later. He uh, completed a two week course of gentamicin, a month of ceftriaxone. So he's still on doxycycline. We had adjusted dosing for phototoxicity um, and we added rifabutin. And we repeated a Bartonella PCR a couple times after discharge and they were negative both of those times. Um, and we sent a Bartonella PCR. Um, we added a Bartonella PCR to his uh, bone marrow study from the beginning of his evaluation, and that was negative. Just trying to see if this was a unifying diagnosis. So, um, and his cell lines also improved in the beginning, especially. Um, he went from 1,000 to over 2,000 white cells, and he kind of plateaued. And unfortunately, we we're trying to get him back in clinic to see if um, he has further improvement. So, same with his ANC and his hemoglobin. And our questions for discussion are, um, could Bartonella endocarditis, um, is this a complication of his immunocompromised state? Does he have, um, you know, an Alps-like syndrome? Or uh, does Bartonella fully explain the course of his illness, including his cytopenias, his glomerulonephritis, and mutation-negative Alps phenotype? And from an ID perspective, um, the, for uh, sake of time, I'll skip this slide. Um, there is, um, in uh, Nationwide, there were two cases recently of Bartonella endocarditis. So this prompted them to just do a literature review and evaluate um, 12 published cases, and there um, are 11 published cases of Bartonella endocarditis. And there are only um, 11 of, so from 1990 to 2016. And of those 11, um, eight of them had splenomegaly, five had hepatomegaly, um, four out of seven had pancytopenia, three out of seven had bicytopenia. And of the five patients who underwent renal biopsy, all five of them have had crescentic glomerulonephritis. And the two patients at Nationwide, once their Bartonella endocarditis was treated, their pancytopenia is also resolved. So um, this, I'll put the slide back to our question. We wanted to get everyone's thoughts on further work up from here. Thank you so much, Kirti. I think the reason that we wanted to present this patient is we sort of percolated along thinking this child is probable ALPS. You know, we haven't found the genetic mutation, but he fits clinically and um, his, his lab certainly can be consistent. Um, but then when he was admitted and turned out to have Bartonella endocarditis in their case reports that that can sort of cause a similar picture, we, we really wondered if, if that was the cause. Um, and so we were curious if other people had, had thoughts or had other workup that, that would be helpful for us to think about. Um, we've gotten a few questions during Kirti's presentation. Um, the first one came through when we were talking about his growth. And the question is um, from Mark Resnick, is he on human growth hormone? He is not. He's seen endocrinology a couple of times, um, but didn't, they have not um, started any growth hormone um, supplementation. Um, the next question is, did you think about empiric antifungal? Um, Kirti, when he was admitted, did you guys, what did you guys talk about in terms of, of starting antifungal treatment? We thought about, um, the only thing, we thought about maybe histoplasma, just um, living in an endemic area, but um, we just didn't have, um, based on history, otherwise we didn't have a reason to start antifungal treatment. He was um, neutropenic, so we mainly wanted to make sure we had broad gram-negative coverage. Um, you know, to cover for uh, pneumonia. But um, unless we had positive testing, we didn't plan on treating. And do you remember if his shoulder pain was on the right side? I, I do. I think it was I on his left side, actually. It was on his left, left side. side. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last question was, he started initially on immunosuppression for his um, kidney disease. He was initially started on steroids for cytopenias and then put on CellSept after um, he had the kidney biopsy that showed uh, glomerulonephritis. Let's see. 
Had you checked toxoplasma as well? We did not. We did not. um, We didn't think of toxoplasma. That is a good thought, though. And then Andrew Snow is asking any apoptosis assays done. We had, you know, we had talked about that and we never sent it. Um, So that is certainly something that we, we need to do. And then finally, was gene gene testing done on double negative T sorted T cells? He did not have enough double negative T cells to um, to do any any um, gene testing on. Do you? I think you are thinking about yes, somatic fast ligand. We weren't able to get enough T cells to do that. Um, Dr. Uzel, we have been talking constantly. Um, whenever you want to break in, please feel free. Sure. Um, well, first of all, this is a great case of a culture negative um, endocarditis, and it's a great case for an ID fellow. And uh, Bartonella is um, one of the classical organisms, the zoonotic organism that you uh, should be um, able to, you should be thinking of about a when you see a vegetation uh, in um uh, and cu- your blood cultures are negative, and of course the the um, <clears throat> uh, difficulty in diagnosing Bartonella, you have to be able to think about uh, serology and and PCR. So that was all done very properly, and also you very nicely um, uh, showed this this um, uh, link between um, glomerulonephritis and uh, Bartonella endocarditis, which is a known. Um, uh, paradigm and uh, most of those cases are uh, ANCA positive as far as I know. I don't know if um, ANCA was checked in your patient if that was positive uh, or not. Um, but this is these are all cases that are not known to be. Um, uh, they had some um, predisposing factors, but not necessarily considered immunocompromised hosts. A um, few of them were HIV positive that I know of. Um, but um, um, this is a, it's a great um, uh, case for um, looking into endocarditis. But as far as I understood from your case presentation that the cytopenias, they preceded the, um, the um, <clears throat> endocarditis or Bartonella um, uh, infection. So um, my impression with the short stature and probably a little bit of dysmorphic features um, from our conversation, um, uh, along with uh, cytopenias, makes you think of more of a, a genetic basis um, predisposing all the way to this um, final um, event. And uh, in that case, you know, but makes you think what uh, are the um, immune defects, if uh, any, um, that we could think about a, a cytopenia um, as well as a growth. Um, um, uh, failure, growth hormone deficiency or dysfunction, along with a congenital cardiac anomaly. So that's the uh, way that I would think about this case um, um, prior to coming to up to uh, Bartonella. Um, so that those are the questions that I would kind of <laughs> bounce back. So think of these cases that um, autoimmune cytopenia, growth hormone. Um, failure in and uh, maybe associated uh, congenital cardiac anomaly. I think that we are we're getting some questions about um, about the cytopenias persisting despite the therapy. Um, Carl Yu says the insult is then not the Bartonella no. And we you know we've had the same question. We wondered is it because he hasn't been on antibiotics long enough since he has um, such large vegetations on um, his pulmonary conduit, does he need longer therapy in order for the cytopenias to to, um, improve? We don't know. Um, And then does the do the immunologic findings improve after the treatment for Bartonella? And and no, they really haven't yet. Um, When to try Ritux or plasmapheresis? Uh, that's That's a great question. Um, we haven't haven't talked about either one of those things. Right now, he's back on, or he's only on, on Cellcept. He hasn't gone back on um, Cerulimus yet because we had so many questions about what 
what all of this um, truly represents. Is that what you all would would recommend? Is to um, to put him back on Sirolimus? We initially had him on Celsept because of his um, kidney kidney issues, um, and then as you saw, he had a really high Sirolimus level, so we we took it off while he was in the hospital. Well, um, so the issue with glomerulonephritis and uh, sterilimus is sterilimus will induce a proteinuria to a degree. So I would make sure that you switch back to sterilimus. Um, mm -hmm. um, he's glomerulonephritis and um, fully under control, probably. Um, maybe repeat a renal biopsy. I don't know. It would be too invasive, maybe. But um, that's how I would think. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it might complicate your um, <clears throat> response in terms of um, um, glomerulonephritis. Um, definitely the cytopenias um, um, do much better with ser uh, sterilimus um, than MMF in most cases. Um, even the undiagnosed uh, ops you category um uh, uh lymphoproliferative disorders or autoimmune cytopenias so that would be my preference but again um you know you're, you need to um lay your patient's renal problems mm -hmm. um, i um do you think that in this case where you don't have an underlying um <clears throat> genetic um uh, defined genetic defect um, you'll have to go with functional studies like Andy um, suggested, or I'll just suggest that doing um, apoptosis assays um, and um, looking at double negative T cells more carefully um, will be a uh, um, <laughs> preferred way. But mm -hmm. his, yeah, but his lymphocyte profile is, is very interesting um, in the sense that I would say um, from my standpoint, um, I would go with the saying, uh, when all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail, I would um, <laughs> look into, <laughs> um, into the P3K pathway because you have loss of naive T cells and increased TEMRAS, um, uh, and you have a patient with cytopenias and uh, fail, fail, failing, failing with um, um, uh, um, growth, um, growth delay or maybe potential growth hormone um, problems. Uh, with um, um, cardiac defect where there's VSCs involved. In that case, I would um, strongly think about PI3K R1 pathway, which we see very unusual organisms causing um, infections like toxo or um, um, these unusual mycoplasma infections. So um, looking at uh, the coverage on the uh, PI3K uh, um, R1, um, gene and uh, looking at the functional pathway in that um, fun function in that pathway would be my um, the way that I would choose um, to work up this case. Thank you. That is is super helpful. Great. Uh, even though this is not very well known, not very well established, but the R1 patients do have. Um, uh, mild dysmorphic features. There's an overlap with short syndrome, and um, they do have um, growth delay. And um, they are not necessarily all hypogammaglobulinemic, and um, 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 they can have these unusual um, <coughs> uh, infections, intracellular uh, or infections that are thought to be associated with a defective TLR signaling. So, um, um, and VSD has been reported in these patients and a couple of these patients with short syndrome where the mutation is also in uh, PI3KR1. Um, it, let's see, it looks like we have another question. Any lymphatic loss complicating his picture, especially after extensive cardiac surgery? Um, we we don't think so. His surgeries, his his um, initial surgeries were were when he was much younger. So we don't think that that he is having any ongoing losses, and he doesn't have any um, other other symptoms that would be consistent with PLE or or any of the um, other potential ways that cardiac patients can can lose T cells or or immunoglobulin. 
let's see, in any history of cat scratch disease, you know, mom didn't remember that he had any history of, of big lymphadenopathy. Um, but, but no, he was never treated for it. Did we check liver and spleen for granulomas? Could it be pancytopenia secondary to portal hypertension? And no, we didn't do that. We did not um, <coughs> investigate that, that at all. I think that we are getting getting close to um, to the end. Does anyone else have any other questions? We really, really appreciate all of this feedback and and all of these thoughts. No. A great question. How long will we treat? Um, we talk about that. Um, <laughs> every time we we um, see this patient. I think that our our current thought, and Kirti, correct me if I'm wrong, is that he will have six months of antibiotics and then ultimately will get his pulmonary conduits um, upsized and changed out so that the um, vegetations, if we are unable to completely treat them with antibiotics, will be removed. Yeah, that was the plan, I think, because he still has vegetations uh, from his last echo. Okay, thanks, everybody, for um, being part of this. If you have cases, please be sure to um, submit them. We would love to talk about anything that you guys are, are um, thinking about.